Ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues and listeners, here we are again at the end of another week and I've got my, my friend and colleague in front of me who looks very fit and ready for today's session. So Steve, lovely to see you again. Another quick week, my friend. I can't believe it's gone, gone by so quickly, Chris, but, um, but there we go. It's, uh, it's good to be kept busy and busy, what a busy week it has been. How, yeah. how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, good. It's crazy. Um, I remember being young and always listening to my grandparents and my parents saying, you know, enjoy your time at school, enjoy your time here, enjoy your time, because it flies by and the older you get, the quicker it, quicker it goes. I had somebody else also yesterday said, the older you get, the bullets get closer. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's certainly a, a little bit of humour, but reality. <laughs> but on that, on that age um, topic, uh, one good bit of news, Steve, Saga holidays you know they're looking at uh, they're looking at never heard of them chris Is there no, any reason i should know of saga no well i'll introduce i'll send you some pictures maybe mate but it's uh, it's definitely in my category not yours but maybe um, maybe you could send maybe you could send me a, a referral link chris for a 20 percent discount or something yeah I'm yeah, sure yeah. offer that yeah, yeah. Advanced, advanced membership is it, is it is it two weeks two weeks in benedorm and a, an insurance package with it Oi, 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 oi. No, 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 no. But what I'm saying is it's a good bit of news because they're looking at they're looking at when they can get back, um, you know, and, and start, you know, organising and, and, and delivering good holidays again. But one of the interesting things is that they're they're suggesting now that it will be for people who have had a vaccine only. Well, I would suspect that if, if Saga, I mean, for those that don't know, um, maybe you should share who Saga is, but they're but predominantly a UK based operator, I, 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 I understand. Uh, who who um, who tailor most of their packages and their services? Um, you know things like life insurance or or critical illness cover is doing rather well in Saga, and that's because typically they cover the older the older um, population. Who I have to say, Chris, have historically had far more disposable income to spend on on luxury holidays or indeed holidays, um, and um, and will of course be missing out on that. So no surprise that Saga. I mean, I say. I say all of those things, you know, quite tongue in cheek. I think, I think, um, I think, obviously, there's a, there's a, there's a very solid market for uh, for people in those age groups plus sixty, and in terms of their their discretional spend, it's um, it's certainly far higher than than the than the younger groups. So good good for them. I think um, I think if that's a way to encourage people back into feeling safe, then then so be it. I'm not as I'm not as adverse to that as you know I was sent mentioned last week about you know or a couple of weeks ago about health passports and needing these for entry to places, but, um, but certainly I do think given that I would suspect, you know, the, the mass size of the majority of Saga's customers will be vaccinated, particularly the UK customers, given yeah. that, that, that I think 90 of the over 80s are now down in the UK and they're, they're already ratcheting their, you know, their way through the, through the over 70s. I suspect that's not a bad thing. So good for them. Yeah, no, good, good. But on that, on that subject, and I know you've got slightly different opinions, but if you also look at some of the larger venues now that that really need to have um, you know good capacity to start making money again when it opens up, I, I, I genuinely think, Steve, that they're either going to be looking at vaccination passports or certificates or the, the PCR, the testing within 72 hours before you'll be let in. And I think there'll be a lot more door control now and booking control of people coming in and it'll all be checked. So I, I think I think that's one way that they can get things back up and running quicker than they would have done otherwise, but it's also a compromise. Well, I think they're going to have to. I think I think for us, for you know, for you know, I, I haven't been against it, Chris, in the sense of uh, um, you know border control as an additional border control measure. I don't see any reason whilst we've got you know uh, um, you know heavy loads of virus still in the community and virus still shedding into the community, or sorry, virus still shedding from individuals. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't think asking for confirmation of vaccination is a bad thing, but it is to be proven. Yeah, I think whether or not that allows or whether that to, you know, limits the um, the spread um, uh, uh, to others, it might it might reduce the symptoms in those that have been vaccinated. But we don't actually know that it stops the virus yeah. spreading. So a bit of caution there in any case. So as we said before, it is no silver bullet. I think the testing is here for a while yet. Yeah. I mean, I think you know, ultimately, you know, as we increase vaccinations, you know, testing will, will reduce corresponding with that's a, a very simple, logical, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of position to, 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 to establish. But uh, when it comes to entering properties or premises or, or, you know, hotels, restaurants, leisure facilities, going to the gym, well, you can only come in if you've got a vaccination. 
I think that is fundamentally wrong. And as a strong conservative libertarian, I would object to that profusely. Okay, but but not that you can only come in if you've had a test within the last 72 hours. No, I think I think what it does, I mean, if you, I mean, if you getting on an aircraft and traveling and taking into a country additional, additional strains or mutant strains or additional virus load and therefore becoming a burden, a potential burden on the health system of that country is one thing. As a citizen of a nation, um, I should not be asked to have a vaccination certificate um, as I am not asked a vaccination certificate for flu or pneumonia or, or any other sorts of um, hep B, hep B uh, uh, types of illnesses to go into swimming pools or whatever, where potentially those things can spread. So why should I be asked for COVID? I think that is the problem. It's not about entering to the country. It's about as a citizen in country or a resident of that country, moving around should be, should be free and providing you follow the other health control measures. I think that's, that's absolutely logical and, and sensible. Yeah, well, like I say, I, I think I think there'll be a, I think there'll be a mix of there'll be a mix of issues as pressures are on, you know, to get everything, everybody and everything back back out and running as quickly. But in some nations, Chris, some people in my age group, uh, which is still sub forty, I have to I have to uh, 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 remind you. And good man um, for clarifying that. Well saga, done. Saga earlier, uh, not 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 much below forty, though. I have to add that it, 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 it increases every year um, as I fall over the precipice when I disappear over forty. You know? Um, but you know, in some countries, Chris, you know, people in my age group um, uh, might never, um, uh, you know, might not get vaccination until 2021 or 2022. In some countries, in fact, in Indonesia, um, you know, they're starting vaccinations of um, of the young before the elderly because they see that actually the young have got an awful lot more uh, a useful life and uh, a life expectancy uh, and contribution therefore to society. And actually, they're starting other way around. They're starting with the plus 18s to the 30s, 30 to 450, etc. And, and, and vaccine in the LDA last. So but there's lots of lots of challenges with that. But I mean, in, in my son's age group, he's three, he'll never get a vaccination. I mean, what, why, why would he? Why would he expect it? Does that stop children going into, into leisure centers or soft play or, or nonsense like that? Where, where, where do you draw the line? Maybe I ask, maybe I answer that question. Yeah, yeah. It's, I don't think it's a matter of drawing a line. It's a matter of, it's a matter of having a, a like a, a South Pole and North Pole and coming together and trying to balance so that you reduce as much of the effects. And I, I just think there'll be a combination, Steve, but I do think that people will be requested if they want to open up earlier, they'll either have to have had a certificate for the PCR, the 72 hour, they'll have to have that or, and a combination of whether or not they've been vaccinated or not. But that's, you know, like I said, it's how to get the engines rolling, how to get everything going as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. And I don't think most of it, most of it won't be um, a talking point anyhow until at least March, April time. And even longer, if you look at Australia. Well, I heard this week that um, Simon Birmingham, uh, the foreign minister, um, the minister of foreign affairs um, in Australia has suggested that um, that Australia may not open its borders until 2022. Um, I find that staggering, really. Yeah. Um, I mean, the case load in Australia is extremely low. Um, you know, depending on which side of the of the of the coin you sort of um, you know lose two sides to every coin, as we as we well know, Chris. Um, uh, depending on which camp you're in, um, you'll either say Australia has managed it exceptionally well, um, uh, but Australians have given up a lot of the freedoms and liberty to 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 contain the virus in the way that they have, or that they have absolutely catastrophically destroyed the economy and employment and um, um, you know and this all sort of um, one-upmanship that should not exist in Australia because there's something in Australia called being un-Australian. It's all about the tall poppies and the tall poppy syndrome keeps everybody at the same level of equilibrium. If you're a tall poppy, you can yeah, yeah, cut down. Yeah. Um, uh, and so one doesn't raise their head over the parapet too much in Australia. Uh, however, that's happened a lot recently with, with domestic and state politics, which I find um, which I find uh, quite disturbing that these state premiers have, have found the powers vested in them by the um, by probably the uh, the governors and some some legacy of archaic British um, British legislation that still existed in the statute books that they can uh, that they can unilaterally decide to do the close their borders and do what they like in it with, without any recourse to the federal government in Canberra. I think that 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 paves the way for some rather interesting future political discussion, but more critically. And the Commonwealth of Australia probably will not see foreign visitors until 2022. 
Yeah, it's. I mean, it's amazing to be considering that. Absolutely incredible. And uh, I mean, it's just a whole year. It's madness, isn't it? Mind you, yeah. you're where you are. So you're in. You're in, um, you're in down now, and it's estimated till summer, isn't it? We are in, um, so formally, we are in that uh, there's two, 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 uh, uh, I'm in Malaysia, um, for those not aware, the listeners not aware, and we have um, two things here. We've got a state of emergency, yep. uh, which lasts until the 1st of August, um, but don't be too alarmed by that. That's generally a political lever that allows the, um, allows democracy to be collapsed um, uh, around us, and, um, and um, a unitarian rule, um, where the Prime Minister rules through His Majesty the King, and um, and there is no recourse to parliament. Um, so of course, what that means is the opposition, um, of which um, many of us um, are supporters in, 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 in this place. That's all I, sh- oh, that's all I should say. That um, would um, would find themselves without a voice in parliament. That's a problem. However, it allows the government to kick the can of those for elections and all that sort of stuff. So you know, one could view that as a political tool rather than a health. Uh, uh, um, you know, health measure. Uh, we are, we do have a quite strict lockdown here. Um, it's quite um, difficult to move around. There are roadblocks everywhere. Uh, you have to have passes and permission to exit. Uh, police and um, police approvals, which can be done online. It's actually quite a sophisticated system and has been in place since March last year, actually. So um, anyway, we move around. Uh, it's not a bad place in the world to be, apart from the old thunderstorm of every day. Um, but um, I get my my favourite little creatures beer from Western Australia, and I'm quite happy. So. Um, not, not, not terribly bad, but I, I can't see that the Asia Pacific, I think, Chris, by the sentiment of a lot of our, um, you know, uh, uh, citizens here in ASEAN and more broadly around Asia, they are more, a little bit more sensitive to health um, health uh, uh, control measures and a little bit more compliant, I have to say, as well, than my European brothers, sisters and cousins. Um, and therefore, they are a little more cautious, even when we allow a restart, um, you know, people that are more cautious here to sort of see, well, maybe just hang on for a little bit longer, stay at home. We do have a lot of intergenerational um, living in this country as well in Malaysia, which is quite common. Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, as you well know, Chris, people yeah, yeah, yeah. tend to tend to live as families um, together um, uh, with in-laws and outlaws in the same house. I don't, thankfully, but um, but many do. Yeah, yeah, and thank you very very much for that. Now, also EasyJet bookings up two hundred and fifty percent. So that was also a nice bit of news. So it shows that people are are so keen to do something. And Absolutely. I think as soon as the doors start to open, or even there's a chink, the yeah. rush to get through. They're out. Absolutely. Good on them. And look, that's, the that's, the, that's the camp that I'm in, Chris. Um, we have a holiday booked, actually, um, in a couple of weeks' time. Domestic holiday in Malaysia, obviously. Yeah. Um, so whilst the state of emergency exists, if the movement control order is lifted, uh, which it ought to be by the end of the month, um, when we can think, move around more freely, then we can still travel domestically interstate, um, uh, which is a good thing. Um, helps keep you know airlines and tourism and hotels and going. And when I travelled domestically uh, before Christmas, it was it was rammed. The places were heaving, and it was so good to see people back together again, spending money out, enjoying themselves uh, with family and kids screaming and playing. And you know, it, it brings a real real sense of um, uh, you know, it sort of. Life back again, you know, really after such a long time of not having it. So I'm not surprised that that pent up um, sort of demand exists. And in fact, um, you know, uh, I saw those numbers being published in EasyJet. Uh, I've got a few close um, contacts there and friends there. So, you know, I, I, I heard that that was the case and I'm not surprised. I do think that other, not every market, Chris, will respond in the same way as Europe. I think the Europeans, I mean, Europe, um, we we'll talk about the continent of Europe, not Europe yeah, yeah. The political uh, nonsense, political union. Um, but Europe, the continent, generally operates as a domestic market. Um, yeah. Europe, UK, and um, you have Schengen and extra Schengen, but um, but generally it operates as, as a domestic market, um, much like ASEAN does here in here in here in Asia. Uh, although it's uh, it's um, it's a dozen dozen countries and political grouping. Um, uh, so I do think that, um, that, 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 that Europe will, um, will, will return demand quite quickly and promptly. And we saw pockets of that, Chris, in the summer and July and August after the first lockdown. We saw it again in the half term um, and the autumn, uh, the autumn break. Uh, we didn't see much of it at Christmas, of course, for obvious reasons, because everything would be locked back down again. So I'm not surprised that that demand is there. I think, um, I think we'll see the same probably in North America uh, and the Middle East, but I do not think we'll see that same pent up demand 
translating into into bookings um, in Asia Pacific. I, I think I think people here are, are rather more sensitive, as I say, and a little bit more cautious about um, about uh, you know returning to to air travel or indeed leisure travel or business travel uh, anytime soon. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, but continuing with a little bit of good news, it's also nice. I was so pleased to see um, company I used to I worked for for 28, 29 years, Lufthansa now investing back in the in the cargo center in frankfurt so work on that's already started and that's due to carry on until 2028 so that's great that's a great message out there as well and um obviously they're doing they're doing their bit you've got malaysian steve restructuring so that's good news yeah malaysia airlines here close to my heart um uh, malaysian uh, you know gone through a difficult period of course for many a year um you know, uh, they struggled after the um, after the GFC, um, having come out of that. You know, I wouldn't say unscathed, but um, they come out of that. You know, over over a long period of time, they then had whilst they're in sort of transformation mode already, the extremely sad loss of MH370, um, and then they had only a few months later MH17, uh, another um, another very sad loss, completely unexpected, and and and, and you know that that set them back. A fair way. That's 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 for sure. Um, and of course, just as it's sort of, you know, they've been managing it, they've been in transformation mode now for the last few years. Um, just as sort of the, there's some lightning in the tunnel, potential orders and so on. I hear the grapevine. Then COVID comes along and sets them back again. But um, I have been keeping a close watch on Malaysia Airlines. I'm pleased to see that um, that yesterday, I think, or the day before, certainly Wednesday or Thursday. Sorry, yesterday. Of course, it's Friday. Uh, of course, yesterday. Uh, absolutely. Yesterday yeah, was no. Friday. Um, no, it wouldn't be today, Chris, when we record this show. Uh, but I think on Wednesday or Thursday, um, and it was Thursday, the UK, the UK High Court um, in London approved the uh, the restructuring plan and the um, and the creditor plan. So there'll be a hearing in London, I think, on, in in, uh, in February, and um, in which case that will that will be expected to, to to push through, I suspect. But um, what I'm hearing from the market as well is that the the lessors um, are commending the work done by. Hulahan Loki, the um, the uh, the investment banker and the restructuring, and and I wish Malaysia Airlines well. So hopefully more on that to come. But um, certainly still still uh, this is the beginning now now I guess of the um, of the um, of the of um, transformation. I think Mark three. So good luck yeah. good luck to Malaysia Airlines. Yeah, no, but that's mm -hmm. like you said, transformation. That's the that's the word that everybody's using now as well. So there's there's an awful lot of change and 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 re realignment, which is not a bad thing. And Norwegian with their rescue plan as well. So that's good. I, I have to say I um I haven't seen uh, I haven't seen much in the Norwegian plan, Chris. So maybe you want to enlighten me and our listeners. Well, basic basically, Steve, as you know, that they started to reduce with the international flights, and then they have reconsolidated, and it looks like there's clarity there now. So there'll be there'll be more of a follow up there, but just as far as you know, everybody everybody having a, a uh, what we say a, a negative slant on whether somebody should or shouldn't carry on whether it was expected. I just I just feel at this moment in time now, anybody that's getting some good support or has got an opportunity now to transform, transition, change well, online, I think it's good for the industry. And, uh, you know, we, we need to pull behind everybody who's, who's focusing on that. Providing, Chris, it's not good money after bad. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. If, if, if it's private good money after private uh, 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 bad money, then that's one thing. But when I saw that the Norwegian government was involved um, and the Norwegian taxpayer then is on the hook, that, that really, um, really brings into question if this is a, you know, if Norwegian were a viable business prior to COVID-19 uh, sort of hitting, uh, hitting our industry, you know, it's you know, a big slap on the, um, on, on, on the side of our industry. And, you know, through all the banks as well, yeah. Um, it, if Norwegian were viable pre March 2020, then I suspect that there's potentially an argument for, for you know, um, you know, strong, compelling levels of support, um, political uh, support, political capital uh, uh, in that sense, uh, and, uh, and financial support in terms of cash. Um, if, however, it was not a viable business, what does that do to the rest of competition, the rest of European operators? Who do not get access to state funds um, uh, or get access to the same level of um, of uh, 
favorability when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, political uh, uh, capital. So I do think that it's something to be said, Chris. That, that I would have thought there should be some some sort of means testing uh, that ought, ought to go on. And as long as as long as um, you know uh, you know there is a there is a return on that capital being invested for the Norwegian taxpayer or indeed any other taxpayer. The German taxpayers are, are on the hook for a lot with your old with your old paymasters. Uh, the Dutch and the French taxpayers are on the hook for an awful lot. The Italian taxpayers are on the hook for well. Ever, I suspect, <laughs> with that basket case of Italia, and um, uh, so you know, I'm all I'm all for getting support into industry, providing it's equal, providing it's universally available to all, private sector owned or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the excuse of of you know being state owned entities is one thing, but Norwegian is not a state owned entity. British Airways is not a state owned entity. Um, Air France KLM is a listed entity. Uh, care, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and others. So, look, you look at it in that sense. Say, well, actually, you know, you know, in the Middle East, it's a bit difficult to argue, Chris, because the shareholder is making a cash injection, whether it be in Qatar or it's in Emirates or it's in Abu Dhabi. That is the government shareholder making an injection of cash in terms of an equity position or 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 or, or a cash position, and that's that's one thing. But doing it in another way that, um, that 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 gives a leg up to some airlines over others, I think, is is not the right thing. So. Uh, let's see what happens to Norwegian in the future, but you know, going to be a tough slog for them and everybody else, Chris, and everybody else. Yeah, no, no, I agree, and I think I think the point you made there about having some sort of a sustainability um, barometer, and if you don't Means testing, or, or yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, if you don't meet that that level or where the dial is, that, then it would be questioned. But I think if there are certain criteria that you do, so in the case of Norwegian, there, you know, the international side, they're they're sort of rationalising, they're looking at what could be viable as long as it's done from that perspective anybody who's making a go of it now i think you know hopefully they'll be able to hold on for another three months which is good you mentioned klm steve and and, and martin air now they're also cancelling loads of flights and now we've got the our, our the, the uk government here and the environment secretary george eustace talking about you know full closure of the uk's borders and putting pressure on boris well uh, I think that's the minister speaking out said his brief, is it not? <laughs> but it's not, it's coming from it's coming from many quarters. And again, the press, the media, the questions they ask, you know. Well, if he was my minister, he'd get the sack. Um, you know, I, I mean, th th these these ministers are, are, are dangerous. They speak outside their briefs, and um, and uh, all they do is they carry fear and allow allow newspapers to print stories of things that don't exist. Uh, including, I saw yesterday. I mean, the finance ministry, the treasury today said, no, we, we, somebody said we're paying five hundred pounds for every co co positive COVID test. So any test positive, positive with COVID, the treasury will give you five hundred quid. Yeah. Um, the treasury confirmed that's not the case, and that might be hearsay, but that's not what necessarily happened. So I don't listen to anything nonsense like that, Chris. Yeah, no, no, no. I agree with you, but uh, you know the fact that it gets so much coverage. And it makes but, that, but that's why we're in. That's why we're in this negative spiral. Why yep. people are so fearful about you know about this disease, and why people are not you know treating it um, treating it with the sort of the yeah the caution, but also the pragmatism that if you follow the bloody rules, you do the right thing, this thing will go away. If you start um, you know building up these conspiracy theories and all these fears and you know anti-vaxxers and no. non-halal or haram vaccines or it's got alcohol and stuff, all this bollocks and bullshit. It's nonsense. Stop it. Um, just get on with it. Wash your hands. Stay, you know, stay uh, safe, and um, and and um, you know, follow generally what um, what you're told. But if you if you if you if you try to you know create this into something more than it is not, um, it will have devastating effects, as we've seen, not on our industry but on economy lives. Uh, I saw a friend yesterday, and a friend, a sort of an extended friend, a friend of mine, um, her uh, boyfriend's uh, ex-boyfriend's father. Yeah, uh, committed suicide uh, because he ran a nightclub in um, in uh, in uh, in Essex, and um, and uh, you know his business obviously has been thrown into turmoil. And um, and uh, anyway, my friend's ex, his father, he he he, um, he he committed suicide yesterday as a result of all of this. And you think you know that's when people put into put into practice the impact of mental health of these media organisations that have got responsibilities. Of you know probably more responsibility than the government in many regards to report properly and report ethically and report legitimate facts and not create spin, fear, 
and spiral spiral people into the uh, the situation that they can't sort of get out of. And I'm not saying the media were to to to, to, to you know uh, uh, um, responsible. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I do think it has a massive impact on on people, Chris. And when people are in that fragile uh, state, it's very dangerous for people to start you know coming up with them um, with um, with bullshit that um, that supports their own theories. Uh, and their own, uh, their own, their own fears, their own insecurities, and pushing that on others—that is wrong. No, it is. It is, and it's terrible to see. It's terrible to see the protesters, even outside hospitals, you know, telling the nurses and doctors and porters and cleaners and everybody that you know what that, that there's there's no major issue, and they're coming out of almost like a war zone, and and you know, absolutely. Well, this, this division. I mean, you have. You know, big news this week, of course, of President Biden, um, you know, taking office. That's um, that's comforting for many, uh, uh, but for others, it's um, it creates even further division. And I think um, what we've seen is, you know, that 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 division, that lack of unity. And I think Mr. Biden mentioned that in his speech, you know, twenty times. I think something had said, uh, that was it. The very use word is, um, you know, all of this, um, all of this does not help. Actually, what we're going to try and do is operate in unison. That means countries not calling out others for not doing the right thing. It doesn't mean that you can call it the, the British strain or the China virus or whatever the hell you want to call it. Responsible world leaders have got to use the right language at times like this. They help encourage a collective, collaborative approach that, um, that ensures that we can get rid of this blasted thing as quickly as it, um, as it arrived. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a glad and and as you say, it's a global thing. It's not an individual thing. But talk coming back to Biden now. I mean, what a difference! I don't know if you've seen all the all the clips of the White House. Every single person wearing masks. Now he's even he signed certain certain uh, directives for masks, and he wants masks to be worn on all aircraft. So he's he's really making his position clear. He's called it. He's called it the one hundred. Um, is it the one hundred day mask challenge? Yeah, is that what it's referred to. Um, I'm not sure that sort of making it sort of a bit more like a like a like a, like a game or a quiz will help. But um, anyway, look, let, let's see. Time will tell. Um, yeah. Time will tell. Yeah, but it, it all helps. And now back to the vaccine. Singapore, obviously, they've rolled them out and they're doing well. But Singapore are making a point now of the fact that they're rolling them out um, to the aviation industry. So there, people like Donata, or, you know, all the staff are getting vaccinated. I know that was a hot topic during the week, but it's one that. Uh, Depending, so wrong, Chris. depending which side of the fence you're on and what you consider to be the effects of frontline workers is, is uh, you know, is, is, is a different. Well, I know Donata Singapore uh, very well. I know SAT Singapore very well. I saw them all there. I saw their posts. People were sending them to me there. For those that don't know, I lived in Singapore for a couple of years and I worked at Changi Airport. And yeah. um, I think it is extremely wrong that um, the private sector is getting access to vaccines uh, when they're, and they're not at risk groups. And yet there are still countries in the world that do not have the pockets the size of Singapore, my country here in Malaysia, my, a country where you and I spend a lot of time, Chris, in the Philippines, um, a country where I spend a lot of time on holiday, Indonesia and Thailand. Um, they don't have access to vaccines. Yet Changi Airport and Singaporean government policy thinks it is legitimate to vaccinate and inoculate people who are in very, very, very low risk categories that are privately employed at Changi Airport. That just shows you, in my view, where Singapore will do what you know, tries to tries to play a good game always, and sort of you know its view and its position in world politics and economy. But Singapore first, and Singapore always first. It's a very closed shop, very parochial, and it, this 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 week could just show that to be the case even more. Yeah, and it's also I mean it's interesting looking at any tables or any data, but you know when you look at the the um, the vaccination tables and you see like Israel, Singapore, the UAE. I mean, obviously the UK's up there. I mean, it's good to see, um, but it's not a competition as such. I think the UK is number four, and the UK is vaccinating the most at-risk people in our society, the most vulnerable, the most likely to, to, to get severely ill, the most likely to die from this virus. I think that's a bloody good show. Nice one. Very patriotic, eh? No, I, 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 it's not about being... I mean, any country that does that, I think, I think it's... Um, it's, it's um, you know, I actually, I also pride Indonesia on standing up and saying we will not vaccinate the elderly first. Because, you know, if, you're, if, the, if the life expectancy is 71 in Indonesia, uh, why would we be vaccinating those in the plus 80 or plus 70 groups first? What we want to do is vaccinate those at the, at the other end of society to keep them, to keep them, uh, to keep them at, uh, at less at risk and, and the healthiest. I, I, I also take my hat off to them and taking a stance 
um, which is the only one I've seen in the world, and happy for our listeners to correct me um, or, to, or to provide some of their thoughts and inputs. Um, but I do think there's something to be said for that. They're taking a stance and they're saying, no, our life expectancy is, is not all that brilliant. We know we've got work to do on a broader macro level, but so right now we'll protect the youngest in society, those that contribute the most, those that contribute to the exchequer, those that have got the longest uh, life possible, and therefore we're going to vaccinate them first. I think there's something to be said for that, Chris. So it's nothing to do with the UK. I'm very happy to criticize the UK, as you well know. It's nothing to do with patriotism. It's everything to do with them with thinking what is morally and legitimately right um, in, in, in looking after the vulnerable in society, or indeed those that contribute longest to society, as in as them the road in Indonesia. Well said. Well said, sir. Now I've got a point for you. What do you think of this, this latest uh, bit of news about British Airways cargo workers potentially going on strike again? Well, you can also talk about the Fire Brigades Union when we're at it, or the um, yeah, Fire or, Brigade, uh, Act, yeah, the TWU, fire. or all this nonsense as well. Where, yeah, where, where do we start with unions? I think I think unions have had nothing uh, to, uh, positively to show for themselves during this um, during this this pandemic and crisis. Uh, in fact, I know from discussions that I've had with them um, with some of my clients and uh, and uh, you know customers in Australia, the unions are all hankering for pay rises as a result of this crisis. And um, when uh, when the rest of the private sector is um, having to sort of you know narrow in and um, and uh, you know uh, uh, you know sharpen their pens in terms of um, of getting cost out of the business and the unions are going in saying oh, we, we, we deserve you know a massive pay rises um the public sector don't want to be included in any in any um, ring fencing of pay which i think is phenomenal i'm not yep. talking about frontline doctors and nurses by the way i'm talking about other public sector workers mostly predicated by by lazy bureaucratic civil servants certainly yep. in my experience in the uk and australia uh, and malaysia um, um, they don't want to take any pay, any pay cuts and share the burden of the rest of society. They expect the private sector to do it. But if you're not in a union, um, you take the burden. But the unions, for example, the Fire Brigades Union in the UK are preventing their members from supporting the vaccination drive. Yeah, it's crazy. I find that incredible to believe. And they're doing it on health and safety measures. Yeah, I saw yesterday Thompson Airways, or what they call them, TUI, TUI yeah. cabin crew and ground staff uh, from East Midlands Airport in a hospital, uh, a large hospital, I don't know if it was Nottingham or Leicester, but certainly somewhere around the East Midlands area, in there vaccinating people. Isn't that wonderful to see? The private sector doing their bit in there, two e cabin crew and ground staff. I take my hat off to them, literally, for those that are not on video, I do have a hat on, which I just removed. But I take my hat off to those ladies I saw yesterday, Chris, it, it vaccinating um, the elderly and the, and the vulnerable and that risk, um, and they can do it. Yet we cut the fire because you can't allow a firefighter to do so. So look, to your question, British Airways cargo, um, I don't know the I don't know the argument there. I'm sure it's to do with paying conditions, as it always is. Which it's it probably is, a lot yeah. of nonsense. Yeah, there we go. I've got nothing, nothing much to say about it other than get back to work, lads. The, 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 the globe needs you right now. And um, I have to say, Chris, it probably is not the members here at uh, that are spoiling for a fight or for action. It will be the officials and the organisers, and there's a that's time. typically how I find it. Yeah, and there's a there's a there's a time and a place. There's a time and a place to do it, and I, I think anything like that now is not the time nor the place. Coming back to the volunteers doing the vaccinations, there was also some St John's ambulance uh, members who were doing it, and one guy, one guy, he said he said he feels so good that he feels as if he's making a difference and doing something for the good of everybody. And you could see that satisfaction on their face. I think it's a wonderful thing. And, it's amazing, uh, amazing yeah. to see. And then you've got then you've got reprehensible behaviour like that from unions. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Now, anything that you'd like to end this week on? What are we looking forward to next week? Um, we've got public holiday next Thursday for Thai Prasam, um, and we've got public holiday Monday in Malaysia. So normally it'd be a long weekend. I would normally go away somewhere. Um, but um, so I'm looking forward to um, very much staying at home during lockdown uh, next weekend during a during a uh, what is a five day weekend that we very rarely get. But um, we're all in the same boat. So um, anyway, look much more of the same, Chris. I guess I think um, I think I'm looking forward to really seeing the um, seeing the uptick in the vaccination drive, not just in the countries that already started but in us really helping mobilise the logistics to support the nations that haven't yet started. That's really important. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think a bit of momentum will always help sort of drive some of that um, performance through. 
Um, uh, apart from that, I'm looking forward to a weekend um, of, um, of a little bit of r and You and I have got some work to do tomorrow um, for a client, so, um, so let's not forget that. But uh, apart from that, I wish everybody a very safe and happy weekend, and, uh, and uh, we'll touch base next week. Yep, look forward to it, Steve. And um, and like I say, there's there's been a couple of really good podcasts just gone out. And um, as you say, next week, we've got another few really, really good ones. So as well, for anybody that's listening into our show, some of the other podcasts, you know, with some of the leaders, we've, we've had some great people on, some good ones coming forward. Please have a listen in and look after yourselves everywhere and whatever you can do for anybody else, please do and continue to care for everybody that you see because together we make the difference. So all the best, everybody. Stephen, lovely. Look forward Is to a new hat next week. <laughs> Cheers, Chris. Take care. All the best. Thanks very much. See you.